Okay, so I, I blew all the money on the uh, fancy graphics, as you can see. Um, I, I do wonder if we should start with uh, a minute silent for, silence for J.P. Morgan, who um, <laughs> I think we should describe as the Dumbledore of the financial world, who foolishly employed a trader with the nickname Voldemort, and then wondered why he ran off with several billion uh, dollars. Uh, that'll be the last Harry Potter joke, because it's sort of the limits of my, my knowledge of the saga. Um, However, I think it's worth remembering, because the main thrust of what I'm going to be saying is to agree with the previous speaker that the current crisis is not a financial crisis. That doesn't, for a second, take away from the venality uh, and the horrors of what some of the people in the financial sector do. Let me start, though, with a point which I think now is universally accepted, which is the crisis we're seeing now is not simply the deepest crisis since the 1930s, but that the recovery from the crisis is far and away the weakest recovery that we've seen since the 1930s. And one of the key things that we have to explain when we talk about the dynamics of the crisis is why the recovery has been so fragile, so weak, uh, and so uncertain. If you look at the world, uh, the key areas of the world economy today, it's a pretty dire situation. I'll, I'll try not to repeat what was said in the, in the first session, but if you look at the Eurozone, the Eurozone is now heading back into recession. Unemployment stands at a quarter of the workforce in Spain, a fifth in Greece, one sixth in Portugal. The core banks of the Eurozone are dependent on funding from the European Central Bank, the uh, massive stealth bailout by the ECB, which has more than doubled its balance sheet since the crisis began. There are new shocks developing every day inside the Eurozone. Astonishingly, over the last week, the Spanish government has realised that its own banks might be exposed to the uh, housing bubble that blew up two or three years ago. That's just one small example. But shock after shock hits the financial system. Uh, finally, in the Eurozone, as we heard this morning, politics and e economics is now completely inter intertwined. Governments face the prospect, if, if they're not harsh enough on austerity, being overthrown by the Troika, and if they're too harsh, being thrown out by the electorate. In the case of the Greek government, they face the possibility of both within the matter of weeks and weeks and months. In the US economy, which has benefited largely from not being uh, Europe, uh, even the US economy, if you look at the growth, which is supposedly quite, quite uh, impressive growth in the final quarter last year, uh, fully two-thirds of that growth came from restocking of inventories. In other words, companies that had run down their inventories during the crisis beginning to restock and re, uh, rebuild them. Uh, the growth that's been experienced in America hasn't translated into serious jobs growth, investment and so on. The recovery remains incredibly weak and fragile. Even in the case of China, uh, there are now very deep concerns about whether the model of accumulation that's developed in China based on <coughs> astonishing levels of accumulation, very, very low wages and an absolute glut of over capacity in the Chinese economy uh, can be maintained. People may have seen that growth rates are now dropping to the 8% mark. Uh, they're getting very close to the level at which the Chinese government fears that it can no longer keep, keep the lid on the social unrest developing in that, in, in, in that country. The whole situation is extremely perilous and the recovery is very, very weak. I want to look at three, three different tendencies within the capitalist system over the past 20 or 30 years that can help to explain why we're in the situation that we're in. People, it's quite been, been quite common on the left to describe the recent period as a period of neoliberal neo boom. The first point I want to make is I agree entirely with uh, Guglielmo Kakedi uh, when he says that the, the, the recent period has not been a period of boom, but it's been a period of depressed uh, profitability. It's been a, been a period that I would characterise as being one of the relative stagnation of capitalist production for the last 30 years. And it's rooted above all in the low level of profitability uh, since the late 1970s, early 19, uh, 1980s. Um, there are many different graphs, many different measures of the rate of profit. This is one that's slightly different uh, to the previous speakers. It's from Andrew Kleiman's latest book, which people should uh, get and read. Uh, it's based on measuring the entire corporate sector's profitability in the US against the historic costs of fixed capital, if people want to know. I can talk in more detail, but I'm not going to, uh, in my introduction, about the figures. But what these kind of graphs indicate is a long downward pass pattern in profitability in the post-war period. 
um, some slight recovery over the recent 30 years, but no sustained recovery in the profit rate in the US economy, and a similar pattern for other core parts of the capitalist system. In this graph, um, profit rates remain oscillating around the 7% mark for most of the last 20 or 30 years. Why does that matter? It matters because, as Marx put it, uh, the, the profits, the ability of capital to expand, is the main motive force of capitalist production. Uh, capitalist production without profitability is like Hamlet without the prince. It's the absolute essence of the capitalist system is to expand by exploiting workers and pumping new value back into the process of production. Uh, without sustained, uh, a st sustained recovery in profit rate, uh, big questions are asked of the, cap uh, of the capitalist system. That's why the world economy has been in a, system, in, in a situation of relative stagnation. That's not to say that there's been permanent crisis or permanent stagnation or absolute stagnation across the system. Uh, there has clearly been dynamism in some sectors of the world economy, China being the most obvious. You can't talk about someone that's been growing at 10% over sustained periods of time as being completely stagnant. Nonetheless, those uh, bursts of growth and the unevenness produced as different capitalists try to reorganize the system to compete on a global sc scale uh, coexist with relative tendencies towards stagnation across, uh, across the, capitalist, uh, the capitalist system. Uh, that has consequences, the most obvious consequence, something that is widely accepted now, is that if you look at the patterns of accumulation, if you look at the extent to which capitalists have been investing in production, uh, those levels of accumulation have been muted for 20 or 30 years now. Uh, secondly, if you look at uh, things such as growth, um, Kalkadi spoke about the problems of using GDP figures, but even if you look at the GDP figures for all their limitations, I don't think you can say the periods from uh, 91 to 2000, say, is a period of neoliberal boom. The levels of per capita growth have remained at relatively low levels. These figures, for various reasons, possibly slightly exaggerate the 91 to 2000 period, but even these figures don't show a boom. The second trend which I, I want to talk about, which is also very, very important, is what Marx called the concentration and centralisation of capital. The tendency over long periods of time and through successive periods of boom and slump for the units making up the capitalist system to grow. It's tremendously important because we can't treat the capitalist system, therefore, as an unchanging, static, ahistorical system. We have to understand as, how, as capitalism ages, the forms of crisis and forms of recovery uh, begin to change. <coughs> the reason this is of particular importance to, us, importance to us is because of something, again, that Carcady spoke about. If it's true that the recovery of profitability relies on the destruction and depreciation of capital, in other words, if recovery is something that's brought about through crisis itself, through the clearing out of unprofitable bits of the system, it's far, far easier for that process to take place in a world of small units of capital, small uh, banks, and bits of the system that can quietly collapse whilst the other bits survive. If you're talking about a world of multinationals, if you're talking about a world of giants of the capitalist system, bound together by a financial system that exists on a global scale, uh, coexisting with a system of states in which states are responsible for 20 or 30 or 40 percent uh, of expenditure within a particular country, you can't talk about bits of a system simply collapsing without having an impact on the wider capitalist economy. It's this second tendency that's brought about a period of too big to fail capitalism a situation in which the possibility of large chunks of the capitalist system collapsing and of bringing down far wider parts of the system uh, is a central preoccupation of the ruling class. Even, uh, uh, and that's why that has a bearing on the third tendency which I'm going to talk about, which is the growth of finance. It's also very important for the dynamics of the crisis as, in, as it's unfolded. The, I would argue the destruction of capital, both in the sense of you know, firms collapsing, goods um, being sold at, uh, at, at far sale prices, but also the collapse of bad debts, hasn't taken place to anything like the extent that would be required to spur another major boom of the capitalist system. And that's why if you look at profit rates, 
Um, only in America, where there's been a much more effective uh, process of deleveraging and so on, has there been any kind of recovery uh, in profit rates in the last two or, two or three years? And even there, it's an extremely limited recovery in profit rates. I think our, our prognosis has to be that the uh, getting over this crisis and restoring profitability will be a long, traumatic process extending over years and passing through a number of different phases, which has very important um, strategic implications for us on the left. The third tendency I want to look at um, is the growth of finance over the last 30 years. Um, Robin Blackburn has done some fantastic work on, on, on this area, and I, I certainly commend his writing. Actually, the first place I ever heard, about, heard the word subprime was an article Robin wrote, I think, a full five years ago, early in 2007, which spelt out the dangers in the subprime uh, mortgage market. However, I think that understanding of financialization has to be put in the context of these wider trends of the capitalist system. Uh, my position, similar to uh, Carcades, is that the growth of, of, of the financial system is a consequence of what's been happening in the wider economy. First of all, we have to say that finance is not some parasitic growth on the capitalist economy. If you read the third volume of Capital, Marx is at, is at pains to show how finance and credit plays a central role in the production of value and in the wider capitalist economy. It's captured very well in the, um, in the uh, first quote, which uh, Marx says, banking and credit are a potent means of driving capitalist production beyond its limits, but also a source of, 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 um, of crisis and swindle. We've seen over the recent period both aspects of that, how financial growth has driven the system forwards beyond its limits, but now is becoming the central focus of crisis and, in the case of J.P. Morgan, uh, swindle. But the third quote, which uh, Jane Hardy also gave this morning, I think is tremendously important because what Marx is indicating is that if you have a long period of depressed profitability, there is a possibility of the credit system expanding beyond the capacity of the capitalist system to generate new value. That money can pour out of what's called the real economy into the financial, financial sector as capitalists scurry around looking for some source of profit aside from the real process of production. It's that understanding that Marx gives us that allows us to, expand how, uh, to explain how growth over the last 30 years has become more and more dependent on debt fueled growth and how simultaneously the period of, of the last 20 or 30 years has been the period of, of a series of speculative bubbles in property, in commodities, in a whole series of sec sectors in the dot-com bubble of the 1990s and so on and so forth. The expansion of finance involves what Marx called the growth of fictitious capital. It involves people uh, gambling on the capacity of the system in the future to generate new value. The problem, which is captured very well in the second quote up there by Marx, is that the production of new value doesn't always tra transpire. And the vast accumulations of fictitious capital uh, if they don't lead into, in, towards real accumulation, real growth and real profitability, can in turn become a burden weighing down the system. Not only that, but they become an important mechanism through which crisis is generalised across the system, spread across the system, as the chains of credit and debt begin, begin to break. As companies fail to pay their debts, the crisis can be exacerbated and spread throughout, throughout the system. That's why the crisis when it broke in 2007-2008 was very obviously a crisis of, of, of the financial system, but I would argue very strongly that the crisis is rooted in uh, something wider that happened within the real economy in the period of the long post-war boom and the failure of profitability to recover, recover after that. Okay, how long have I got? Five minutes? Yeah. I, I want to... Uh, finish, if I may, by uh, saying a few things about the debate that took place in the, um, uh, it's relevant to the debate in the first session this morning, which is about what all this means for the strategy of the left and for the particular balance between stupidity and institutional stupidity uh, within the ruling class, which I think is an important argument. It's important that we understand it correctly. The central thing I would argue is that the ruling class face uh, contradictory pressures on them at the moment. 
And it's very, very important to understand those contradictions. Stupidity is not something that happens in a vacuum. There's a, if, you, if I can put it pretentiously, there's a dialectical relationship between the contradictions of capitalism and the stupidity of the ruling class. Um, if you look at what happened in 2008, you have a pragmatic response by the ruling class the world over who um, stepped in and took desperate measures to try and shore up the financial system, stimulate the economy, and prevent uh, a full-scale slump of capitalist production, something like 12 it's been estimated $12 um, trillion dollars pumped into the system to achieve that. What you've seen since 2008, uh, almost universally, is a gradual swinging back away from stimulus and towards uh, policies of austerity. And there are three components to this austerity. On the one hand, as people pointed out, there is an element of opportunism. Um, people like David Cameron and George Osborne are, of course, un unreconstructed Thatcherites. They were boasting long before the crisis broke of their desire to scale back uh, public sector spending, uh, attack the welfare state and so on. There's no question that there's opportunism and attempts to quite seriously reconfigure the welfare state in the interest of capital. There's no question that's what they're doing. They're proud of doing it and they're very determined to do it. There's also a degree of ideological commitment to neoliberalism uh, and all, of that, all, all, all that that entails. But we shouldn't leave out of the equation the very real contradictions that the ruling class face in the, cur in, in, in the current period. It is, it is not possible for the ruling class simply to spend their way out of the crisis. This kind of process that we've seen of going from private sector debt to increasingly public sector debt, the process that's been called socialising the, uh, the debt, that's a very polite ter term for it. Actually, it means making all of us responsible for the private sector debt. This kind of process is not sustainable in the long term. There is pressure on the ruling class reflecting that. And I think it's very important that we say on the left that this is not simply a financial crisis or a crisis of under-consumptionism. Consum Were this simply a financial crisis, the solution would be simple. Regulate and scale back finance. Were this simply a crisis of under-consumption that working class people weren't buying enough, the solution will be very simple. Give us all a bit of money, we'll buy more, we'll stimulate the economy, and we'll drag ourselves out of crisis. I'm very much in favour of working class people having more money and spending it and so on. But that's not a solution to the crisis. We have to understand that there's an underlying uh, crisis of, of, of profitability, and that should make us very sceptical about solutions which simply talk about being able to spend your way out, stimulate the economy, and so on and so forth. What these ignore... yeah. What these ignore is a logic of what people like Hayek and Schumpeter and people say, which is actually you do need the liquidation of large chunks of capital in order to pave the way uh, for the next boom. The problem is it becomes more and, more and more difficult as capitalism ages to allow that process of the liquidation of capital to take place. That's why both the Keynesian solutions and the Hayekian solutions, if you like, are both different sides within this insoluble contradiction within, within, within capitalism. The, the, the underlying problems can only be resolved for a process of liquidation, but that process of liquidation is very difficult and traumatic for the capitalist system. I'm told to shut up, so let me, let me sum up on, on this. Does that mean that those on, on the left are indifferent to government policy and indifferent to austerity? <coughs> Absolutely not. Uh, we should be the most implacable, determined fighters to protect working class livelihoods, to oppose austerity, and to defend the welfare state. But I think we have to think carefully about how we pose our arguments. We pose our argument in, in a certain way, and a key term in how we pose those arguments is a question of struggle, and a question of struggle uh, from below. This is a critical element in how we point uh, to our solutions and the way out of the crisis. And this is a very old argument on the left. It goes right back to the argument over a century ago between Rosa Luxemburg and Bernstein in the German socialist movement. Uh, Bernstein argued that capitalism was becoming uh, a, a system of managed capitalism in which the contradictions were being overcome. And what the left, therefore, should argue for was a system of reform as an end in, end in itself. Luxemburg's reply to Bernstein is incredibly instructive. We too want reform, we too will fight for reform, but as we fight for reform, we do so in such a way that we protect working class conditions, 
but also critically, we raise demands that increase the confidence, combativity and determination to struggle of working class people. We pose arguments and demands for reform in a way as a lever of raising working class combativity and strength. I think when we think about the arguments over reform and revolution, we should go back to those debates and understand that our desire for reforms is very different from those people who want to patch up and repair the capitalist system. Our desire for reform comes out of a desire for a fundamental change in the capitalist system. It comes out of a desire for revolution. Michael Roberts um, asked me whether I saw a secular decline in um, the rate of profit and whether it would eventually fall to zero. Um, that's not really my position. As, as Alex reminded us, um, Marx talks about the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall and the counteracting tendencies. And that immediately implies that profit rates don't simply fall and fall and fall, that there are also cyclical um, trends within, within profit rates. And I certainly uh, accept that. But what I'm trying to resist is, is a very pronounced tendency within academic Marxism to say that because of the counteracting tendencies, profit rates are completely indeterminate. They go up and down and up and down. And you can't really tell what direction they're moving in. And I, I, I certainly don't hold to that position. I think there are both cyclical patterns within capitalism, but there are also long-term <coughs> tendencies within the system that can operate over many uh, cycles, many cycles of the boom and bust cycle. Uh, and I'd go a bit further than that, and I would say that the secular tendencies have become more pronounced in the 20th century for the reasons that I talked about, to do with the units of capital becoming bigger, more intertwined on a global scale, and more, in, uh, more embedded with the uh, state and financial system. That, that many of the tendencies with profit rates will operate over, over two or three or four um, profit cycles. They can be very long-term tendencies that operate within the capitalist system. That said, I would argue over the last 30 years, you haven't seen uh, a declining trend in profitability. I think you've seen a fairly flat uh, trend in profitability over the last 30 years. And within that flat overall trend, you've seen uh, booms and slumps of profitability. That would be my reading of the last 30 years. But the problem is that none of those limited booms over the last 30 years have reversed the long-term decline that took, took place in the post-war period. Uh, and not all crises are equal. The crisis of the 1930s is clearly something on a far, far greater scale than many of the uh, crises that have accompanied the boom-slump uh, cycle. And I would argue that the crisis that we're seeing today is a crisis of a similar kind of scale to the crisis of the 1930s, in, in, a, in which a much more far-reaching process of destruction is required in order to pave the way for a new boom. So that's what I would say about, uh, about that. So I certainly don't have a crude position that profit rates fall always uh, and constantly. Secondly, I agree very much with Alex when he talks about financial growth as a counteracting um, tendency. And I agree with Robin when he says it's something that we have to incorporate into our analysis and we have to talk about the patterns of the development of, of, of finance. Um, all I would add to that is that it's very important we understand how those mechanisms work. And I think we have seen a very pronounced uh, shift of value away from what I would call real accumulation into what I think Ben Fine calls fictitious accumulation. The... Uh, expansion of the financial system in the anticipation that at some point uh, real profits are going to be developed from it. And over the last 30 years that's had three cons consequences. First of all, a real apparent dynamism to profitability in the financial system. That's very important, the, the appearance of dynamism uh, in finance. Secondly, the kind of financial Keynesianism that people have talked about in which se sections of the economy are dragged forwards on the back of the financial boom one only has to live near the city of London and see the uh, real accumulation that goes into producing Starbucks and so on around the city of London where people get their uh, coffee in the morning. Um, this is real ac accumulation accompanying financial uh, fictitious accumulation. And thirdly, I think it slowed down the tendency of the rate of profit to fall by diverting money away from accumulation. It becomes a repository of value away from real accumulation, which grew bigger and bigger over time. And it meant that you had to have a whole succession of, of, of financial bubbles. And each time a bubble burst, they had to generate a new bubble. You can see that very clearly. When the dot-com bubble burst in the 1990s, what did Alan Greenspan do? He created a new bubble uh, in, 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 in property markets, leading up to the subprime crisis of 2008. Um, I don't have time to talk about Britain, but I agree with what Mike Haynes said about the way that Britain has played a very 
central role in this development and financialization on a global scale. The third point is about the state, and it's about David Harvey, because someone asked about Harvey's concept of accumulation by dispossession. Um, one of the problems with the concept is that it draws together vastly different things. It's not the same talking about driving peasants off the land in China on the one hand and talking about privatisation of the NHS on the other hand. Th these are two very different phenomena and they shouldn't be understood with the same um, conceptual tools. But one of the things that's very important in this is that, we've n that I don't <coughs> think we should have a position that the state in any sense lies outside of capital. I think we have to understand the state as a central part of the capitalist system and a central, an increasingly central um, part of it in the 20th century. Um, the state has become central in many ways to capitalist accum accumulation, both for its direct role in the, in, in the process of accumulation, but also because 20th century capitalism and 21st century capitalism is a capitalism which requires a collective labour across society in which producing the right kinds of labour power, repairing workers through the health service, a whole series of different institutions that are, that are required for accumulation uh, have sprung up which don't necessarily directly produce value but are central to value uh, production and, and the state is a key uh, part, part of that, that, that thing. That's why even the Tories in their wildest dreams are not talking about completely destroying the health service or scrapping education, we're talking about reconfiguring the welfare state in the interest of, uh, uh, of capital. I mean, tech on pensions is a key part on that because pensions are deferred wages, but critically there's something, there's something that try and make workers feel, oh, I'm, I'm slaving away, but at some point in 30 or 40 years' time I'm going to retire. The Tories believe that they can, they can cope without that uh, safety net for workers and, and, and that workers won't fight. And it's why the fight over pensions has become very, very central. The state is a key part of capitalism in Britain, in Greece, but also in China, and also, I would argue, in the Soviet Union, where you have the purest forms of state capitalism. OK, uh, two final points, and then I'll, sh I'll, I'll shut up. Um, just briefly on the, on, on, on the Eurozone, I think we have to integrate demands to leave the Euro into the package of demands that we raise in countries, in countries like Greece. I think if we're going to talk about nationalisation of the entire banking system in Greece, if we're going to talk about capital controls in Greece, if you're going to talk about elements of workers' power, I think it's unthinkable to raise those demands without also incorporating into them a demand to leave the trap that is the, is, is the Eurozone. Uh, of course, I don't think we should do it in a, nation, in a nationalistic way. I think the role of, of, of people elsewhere in the Eurozone in supporting that demand is, incredi is, is incredibly important. But I think it has to be a demand that we that we raise, and it has to be a demand that we make of, of, of Syriza Arab as part of a package, a series of demands, um, transitional demands, if you like, about, about, uh, about the crisis. Personally, I hope that Syriza uh, do get a stonking great vote in the next round of elections, and I hope that they do, they are faced with a problem of, uh, uh, facing, uh, of forming a government. Why do I think that? Well, first of all, I think that because it's about the confidence of working class people to fight. We want the best possible terrain for Greek workers to fight, and I think that does mean uh, a government uh, elected from the left. Secondly, uh, I believe that working class people learn through their own experiences the limit, limits of, uh, of, of reformism. It's no surprise that you're seeing uh, soft left reformist elements beginning to uh, increase their votes in the current phase of the crisis. It's only through the experience of what those uh, governments and what those parties represent that working class people will begin to learn. And I think a series of government will be a government faced with very, very profound contradictions and contradictory pressures. I don't think it's a stable resting point for the Greek political system, but I think it's something that opens up a framework in which the far left can begin to grow uh, and advance. It's a very, very important stage in that struggle. So I, I, I support the project of Antasia, but I think we, we have to understand that there will be many uh, points in which uh, other left forces come to power, develop, and so on and so forth. We have to both simultaneously, let me put it like this, we have to have pure minds but grubby hands. We have to understand that we have to understand what, what's at stake in this. It's a battle against capitalism, but we have to be prepared to get in to fight alongside people who have not yet recognised that we need to overthrow the capitalist system. I'll finish there.